get started. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the CA2DM Homely Atmosphere uh, seminars. So, um, uh, once again, this uh, series of seminars was created to make people think during this uh, lockdown circuit breaker uh, period. So, we're always trying to discuss things which are interesting in different fields. So far, we have three webinars. Today is the fourth webinar, and today we have uh, uh, the pleasure to have uh, Professor Vinicius Rosa, who um, is actually in the Department of uh, Dentistry and uh, also Department of Material Science Engineering at NUS. So Vinicius has a very special profile because he's actually uh, works in uh, dental applications and uh, how to use different materials for different applications. And uh, today he's going to talk about something that uh, is probably of great interest to all of us, which is uh, the case of biomedical applications of graphene and uh, how uh, advanced materials can help us to fight all these uh, enemies like the coronavirus, COVID-19 virus. So, Vinicius, thank you for, uh, for accepting the invitation to speak. And uh, the way it works is that you talk for around 40 minutes. In the end, uh, I'm, we're going to have a, a Q&A session. So, I will read the, the questions for you and uh, we go until exactly one hour. Okay, so again, thank you. The floor is yours, thanks. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you for the invitation to be with all you here today. It's quite a special day for me because uh, if I go back about seven years and two months, I think this presentation is more or less the pinnacle of everything we have been doing since the day that I first met Antonio and said, look, I, I, I have read about the properties of graphene and I think we can, we can make a difference for, for health with that. So uh, without further ado, let me share my screen here. First, let's see which screen I can share. I think it's this one. Can, can, can you just confirm, Antonio, you're seeing the right screen? Uh, we can see, yes. Okay, cool. So, so uh, as Antonio said, my name is Vinicius Rosa. I'm originally from Brazil. I joined NUS in 2012. And since then, I was appointed as associate professor in the Faculty of Dentistry, Center for 2D Materials, uh, and also the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And it's, it's common knowledge nowadays that we have some uh, invisible enemies, let's say, right? So, so we, we, in, the, in the past few uh, months, we have been more and more exposed to images like this. Uh, let me get my mouse here. Images like this of the coronavirus. But uh, I, I, we need to acknowledge that even though the coronavirus is the, is the hot topic nowadays, it's not the only invisible enemy that threats mankind, right? We, we also have several bacteria, fungi that pose several and, and major risks to our health. So today it's my pleasure to uh, present to you not only, of course, the hidden enemies that we have uh, in, in, in the world, but also the type of work that we have been doing, especially with graphene, to inhibit the, the, the hazardous potentials of these of this, uh, this microorganisms. And how we think, how we have envisioned seven years ago and how we have reached the point today where we believe that the solutions and the technologies that we have developed during these past seven years uh, have the, the potential to save millions of lives. Because we know that 
these things are not are, are not like seasonal things are not like seasonal threats right so so microorganisms are 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 present in our lives on the daily basis causing diseases and we think that we we can target these new solutions we cannot save few people but we can save millions of life around the world and the threat of uh, of microorganisms and in this uh, of course we are hearing about the covid so much and materials this this interaction is actually very strong it's it's so strong the the, the, the issue of surfaces and diseases that even the world health organization has put in their official website some remarks about the survivability of covid-19 on surfaces so it's it's uh, that 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 feeling that we always had that surfaces were important for the cross infection of diseases it has become a major concern now and even the world health organization has has talked about and there's 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 this big storm coming right we are actually already living this this big storm and and our solutions that we have nowadays they are far away of being ideal right we we totally understand how important are the developments of new medicines for instance for instance but now we are seeing that this reactive strategy that mankind has opted to have to wait for a disease to start developing a medicine cannot work forever right medicines just take too long they are too expensive to be developed and if we keep having this defensive strategy we'll never be uh, we will always be behind the curve same is true for vaccines and another issue for vaccines is that maybe the vaccine that works this year may not work for new strains next year and don't forget that even though we are waiting for the, this dream solution for this situation we have so many viral diseases that up to now we don't have any vaccine available uh, don't forget the case of hiv that we know that a vaccine can save so many people but has not happened in the next, in the past 30 years and when medicines are not available and vaccines don't become a reality humanity needs to rely on engineering controls that that are as poor as surgical masks as poor as uh, uh, leather masks or any other type of face shield things that we try to convey some more protection for us but they are so old and with so many technical limitations that we 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 feel comfortable but we never feel that comfortable to the level that we know we are safe so besides viruses uh, we have several other microorganisms and these microorganisms namely bacteria and fungi they are very known for causing for for producing biofilms and biofilms not only threat our health but threats also some other uh, industries like the water and the food industry right so the development of biofilms in 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 water pipes or in in food containers uh is a is a is a major concern for for public health and if you allow me to bring a little bit more for for the things that that i'm more familiarized the development of medical biofilms in medical on medical devices and implantable materials uh can be can be very very risky so imagine you don't like biofilms when they develop on surfaces you certainly don't want these biofilms to develop on surfaces that are inside your body right and and this this poses major risks to 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 the society and and we know that viruses and bacteria and fungi they interact with surface of materials in different ways of course but there are some of those properties some of those characteristics that are very important for most of these microorganisms so for instance the wetting properties of the, the of the materials play a big big role a major role 
in the availability of microorganisms to human touch, right? So that's, that's what we think here. We think that even though we like vaccines, even though we want medicine so much, we need to have some solutions that are more generic, some more general solutions. And material science can play a big role on this, on this trend because you could potentially have materials and coatings that could prevent, for instance, biofilm development, not of a single microorganism, but from a range of microorganisms. Or you could not only rely on a vaccine for a given virus, but you could have some surfaces that could kill, um, a, 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 let's say, a set of different environment, uh, viruses and then uh, protecting human beings. So you imagine about how many lives we could protect if we were able now to decrease viral availability on surfaces like hospitals, doorknobs, public uh, mass transportation systems like buses, the MRT, our airplanes. So we need to think about solutions that will allow us to be in a position that we are not so defensive in, in contamination. So let me tell you the case of implants. Uh, the, 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 let me give you some perspective of how big is this problem, right? I'm a dentist, so I'm very familiar, for instance, with dental implants, with surgical plates for broken bones. But we have a very diverse uh, audience today, so let me give you just a perspective of how big is the so-called implant market. Uh, if you think, for instance, about few surgeons, we are talking about a pool of 8,000 surgeons in a, in a time period, in a period of time of only four years, 8,000 surgeons in US are able to put almost half of a million hip and knee prosthesis. So it's a huge, huge uh, market for implants, right? And, and if you think that the population is growing and the population is getting older, by 2030, we expect to have an increase of almost 200% in the number of total hips being placed. And if we think about, for instance, the dental implant market, so what is cool about the dental implant is that rarely someone gets only one implant. So if you think about the number of implants we have put this year, I don't know the number, nobody can really assert the number, but let's say 10 million implants, it's way more than that. Next year, we expect to have 10 million, 10.5 10 million, and in two years, 11 million. So, so, so every year, every two years, we put one extra million implants in the mouth of people. So there's a lot of implantable surfaces being added to human bodies every year. And then if we think about the infection of these surfaces, the infection rates, they are very, very, very high. So if you think that about one fourth of knee prostheses that are put will face some type of infection in their lifetime. And if you think about how, how fast these problems develop, there are studies showing that about 50% of revisions that happen in less than three years, in, in less than three months from the surgery, from the, the, from the installment of, the, of this, uh, the installation of this prosthesis, 50% of those consultations are because of infections. And if I keep giving you an example, you're gonna realize that this just gets worse. If you think, for instance, that one out of every five people with a dental implant will have problems about infection in their dental implants. And one statistics there is, is, uh, it's, uh, it's really concerning, but don't, don't get the, 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 the news so often, is that 70% of the women in the world will have some problem related to yeast infection during the lifetime, at least once. And that can repeat more times, right? So infections are a big, big concern for humans. And if we think about just about this, uh, is this, this data here about replacement. So what happens in infection? First, when you have the infection, you try to solve it 
with uh, medicines, with, uh, with some debridement, with some surgical procedures for cleaning. But sometimes that fail, and then you need to replace the whole prosthesis. And if we think about this chart, look how many replacements we are performing every year. If we think about people with 60, 70, and 80 years old that have the, the defenses in the body are already weaker, about 10 to 15% of the knee and hips placed needs to be replaced because infection. So it's a, it's a big, big concern. And there's a huge cost for infections that, 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 nobody can, that nobody talks about. It's not the cost of money. Money, is, of course, is very important. But there's the psychological effect. You were, you were expecting to have your problem solved and now you're going, up, uh, you're going back again to the hospital. And now your family is in a, at home worried again. And then there's the problem about insurance. And there's a problem about like in places like Singapore where the money, where the government provides so much money for, 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 for healthcare, you have a huge burden for society. So, 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 so the, the, the cost of infection of surfaces in our body is just not the, 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 the financial cost. There's the whole ecosystem that is surf suffering because of that. So then, what if, what if we start thinking about different solutions? What if we don't think so much about antibiotics? What if we don't think just about vaccines? What if we think, can we stop these infections before they develop? How big would be the impact if you could protect, for instance, implants from biofilm growth? Uh, in 2013, I met Prof. Antonio to discuss some properties of graphene. And this is, this is a paper that we have put together in 2015, summarizing some of the properties that were cool for biomedical applications. But of course, not all these properties were shining for me the first time I read about graphene. There were five of them that, that were uh, more compelling for the, for the case of implants. It's very thin, incredibly strong. It's nearly transparent, so if I put on, a, on an implant, I still can see the implant. I still can see the, the, the structural integrity of this, this implant. Because it's stretchable and has very large surface area, I can coat several types of objects. And during the last four to five years, we have been actually very successful to coat not only flat surfaces, but nearly every sort of 3D shape that has appeared to us. So graphene is able in a way to adapt to the surface of materials, regardless of their shape, as long as you use the right technology to do that. So in the next slides, I'm gonna show you the summary of everything we have observed in the past years that allow us to say very categorically that our graphene nanocoating inhibits biofilm formation from several types of bacteria and fungal species. Uh, our first work with graphene was published some time ago, and it was a very practical work. We get, we, we, at that time, we got some uh, titanium coins and we coated with graphene and we start culturing some simple bacteria, let's say, what we call gram-positive bacteria. And at that time, what we have observed was that on titanium, as expected, there were lots of biofilm formation, but on the graphene-coated specimens, that was just not happening. We have very few biofilm clusters here and there, and they fail to merge. So what was more exciting about that is that we just spit on our samples. And you know, the mouth is the home for more than 700 species of bacteria. 
So when we spit on the sample, we are not putting one type of bacteria there. We are just putting everything we have inside the mouth. And then what we see, if we compare these two images here, is that rarely a biofilm forms on graphene, even though we have used whole saliva. So at that time, we also ran one experiment to know what was going on. And turns out that we were so happy that our graphene nanocoating was not killing the bacteria. And why that was super important? Because if you target the killing of bacteria, if your objective is killing bacteria, you may have some imbalance in the flora. You know, we have in our body good and bad bacteria, and they live in more or less in a very fine equilibrium. So if you start killing unspecifically bacteria, maybe your good bacteria will die first, and then you're left with the bad bacteria. Another problem about killing bacteria, killing biofilms, is antibiotic resistance. If you favor the existence of some strong bacteria, they will just thrive. So we were happy that our, our graphene nanocoating that was certainly inhibiting biofilm formation was not killing bacteria because you don't have this halo of inhibition here as you have there when you use some antibiotics. We have moved forward and very recently we, we started investigating some gram-negative bacteria as well. And that's, that's very, uh, it's a very strong message in this slide because Gram-negative bacteria, they cause, uh, sorry, where's my mouse here? Okay, here. Gram-negative bacteria are more resistant to chemical agents than gram-positive bacteria. So it's even more difficult to get rid of them using chemical methods. And gram-negative bacteria, about 90% of them are able to cause diseases, some type of disease. So when we see results like this not happening on graphene, when you don't see biofilms from gram-negative bacteria on graphene, you start becoming very excited about the potential of this material. And further experimentation uh, led us to some of the reasons why that was happening. And what we have hypothesized and proved was that the changing surface wettability by graphene was actually inhibiting the colonization of the first bacteria. And because it's become very hard for the first bacteria to attach, you don't have the population of bacteria in a density that allows the biofilm formation. So actually you're not killing the bacteria, you're just making the material more difficult you're just making more difficult for them to attach on the surface of the material. So if we put the both set of data together, we can say that the graphene nanocoating on titanium is able to prevent the formation of biofilms from gram-positive and mostly important gram-negative bacteria. How reproducible are these things in other materials? I can tell you that we have tried other polymers, we have tried uh, other metals, other alloys, and this less biofilm formation happens over and over and over, as long as the biomedical materials are coated with our graphene nanocoating. So let me give you some other aspects of our work. That is the part of the work that we have done with fungi. So, so we, we, we tend to have crystallized in our mind how dangerous are bacteria. And we rarely think about fungi. And it turns out that fungi can be even more detrimental to our health than bacteria. So for instance, candida is one of the top four lead causes of infections inside hospitals in the US. And if you have some vascular catheter related infection with candida, I'm sorry to say, but it's a death sentence. Now think where we have candida in our body, everywhere, but I can tell you from my own profession, 30 to 50% of the people have candida inside the mouth. So if this candida finds a way into your body, into your bloodstream, 
and finds a surface of a blendable material, uh, we can have major, major problems there. So what have we done? Well, we coated titanium, we put candida, and this is what we see. We rarely see biofilm formation of candida. And most important, on graphene, we never had the formation of these high fee structures. Actually, we had, but it takes such a long time for them to, to, to happen. So the high fee, what is the high fee? The high fee is when this round bacteria here starting changing the shape. And the high fee is a, is, is a measure of how mature and how virulent is the biofilm. So on our graphene coated specimens, first, you don't have the biofilm. Secondly, you don't have the high fee. And in this study here, we have done some, we have done some extra homework to show that this was a persistent uh, effect. So we have observed for a whole week and very few biofilm formed on graphene compared to the control. So how about antibiotic resistant bacteria? You know, we have in our, in, in, in nature, some bacteria that they just cannot die. That, 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 that's what we call the super buds. But there is some, for instance, the MRSA, there is a type of bacteria that has become resistant to all the types of penicillins, beta-lactans, and other, other antibiotics. And, 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 and these MRSA are the lead cause of, glo of global hospital infections around, uh, around the world, of course, if it's global, right? So, so, so we have also tried with them, right? But we haven't only tried with antibiotic-resistant bacteria. We have gone one step further with mixed species biofilms. Why? Because we know that lots of diseases we have, lots of infections we have, they don't, they don't occur just because one type of bacteria. You have different microorganisms living together. And, and this is very concerning because if you have situations like this in your body where you have bacteria living with fungi, it's very hard for the, for the clinician to find out what is the strategy that will kill both of them. Because you know, antibiotics will not be effective against fungi. And antifungal agents will not be effective against uh, bacteria. So finding this balance, it's, it's a nightmare. So in a nutshell, what we have seen was that mixed biofilms from Candida and MRSA have a very hard time to grow on graphene-coated samples compared to uncoated samples. And if we take a look closer, you're going to realize that the high fee formation for the same period of time happens in such a lower extent on graphene compared to titanium. And if you think about the number of bacteria, all these round cells here that are attached to the hyphae, look at here, very few of them. So now imagine how many lives one could solve if you are just able to decrease the biofilm growth rate, to give to the clinician a chance to buy time for this patient, to take the medicines and eradicate the fewer biofilm that eventually develop, right? So, so, so if we consider the, the, the whole gamma of data that we have put in these seven years, we can say categorically that our graphene nanocoating and the technologies that we have found have, uh, developed to put this nanocoating on biomedical materials decreases the biofilm formation from every other bug we put there, either gram positive, negative, antibiotic resistant, fungi, and mainly deadly mixed species biofilms, right? 
So, uh, where is it? Here. So, uh, what about uh, other types of microorganisms? So let's let's go back uh, for 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 our plethora of microorganisms that we have in our menu, and we think about the the, the most pressing health concern on on Earth nowadays: a viral disease. So we talk about our potential of graphene to inhibit biofilms from microorganisms. So is there a potential there to also fight viral infections before they spread? So let's talk about viruses. Viruses, they interact with surfaces by physical absorption. So that means that surfaces will have some properties that will interact with the properties of, let's say, the virus envelope, and they will be physically absorbed on the surface. And another thing that is known is that the longer the, the longer the time, the longer the time that the virus is in contact with the surface, the higher the chance of being physically absorbed and available to the population. So if we think about a, a, a strategy to decrease the spread of viruses, not the spread, I don't mean about, I don't talk about the multiplication, but let's say the viral availability to general population for our hands, for instance, one of the ways would be to decrease the time that the virus can interact with materials. What is cool about materials fighting viruses? It's because if you think about the six viruses we have in the screen, the six viruses we have in the screen, if we want to target them with vaccines or medicine, you need to target them individually. It's, it's nearly impossible to get rid of all of these things individually. And there's a lot of things that we know from virus characteristics that we could use against themselves. So for instance, we know the temperatures viruses like, we know the humidity they like, we know their isoelectric point, and we know from so many years how the surface charge of the materials interact with the surface charge of viruses. So what if instead of trying to solve one by one, we just start producing materials and solutions with properties that just provide the wrong environment for them. So again, let's think about how graphene could be used to do that. So one of the potential ways that we could do that is by changing the net electrical charge of materials by adding tunable graphene. So let's say you prepare negative charge uh, graphene materials, and then you get that bulk of graphene and you insert in polymers and you change the electrical characteristics of this polymer to be less attractive to viral absorption. Another thing that could be done is to use the sharp edges, in this case of graphene oxide, to actually puncture the membrane of the virus and hence killing them before they infect cells. This has been shown for DNA and RNA viruses in concentrations that were not cytotoxic. Another strategy that could be done, and it has been shown by, by uh, this herpes simplex virus, is to use the electrical charge of graphene itself to attract the virus and make it less susceptible to find a cell. So that's, that's a very nice attract strategy. So you attract the virus to a material before the virus is attracted by the cell. And there's another paper showing a very nice effect that is what we have called the attract and kill effect. So it's not that you just attract into the graphene family material, the virus particle. But this interaction makes very easily to break the viral membrane. 
So if you think about this type of strategy here on the screen, the second strategy, this paper has shown that if you bind a virus particle to graphene oxide at a low, a relative low temperature, you're able to, to break five times more membranes compared to the same temperature without graphene. So in a very uh, uh, summarized way, we could use graphene at least in three different ways to start fighting viruses, either by changing the, uh, the, the, the electrical charge of the materials, or you could destroy viruses by the sharp edges of graphene, for instance, or graphene oxide or whatever graphene family material, or you could use graphene materials to bind to this virus and then to use other sources of energy, either light, UV, for instance, or plasma, or, or maybe heat, to break more and more, making it even easier to disinfect uh, environments. So if we think about applications, biological applications of graphene, there's always one question that comes to the table. Is graphene safe? Is graphene a cytocompatible, a biocompatible material? And, and we have in the literature thousands of papers trying to answer this question. Is graphene a safe material? Well, there's no single answer for this question. Because even though there's a lot of papers showing it's toxic, there's a lot of papers showing it's not toxic. So if you think about, for instance, diamonds and asbestos, they are also both made of carbon in their structure. But nobody dies because of carbon, uh, of diamonds. And lots of people die because of asbestos. So you cannot think about the cytocompatibility of graphene without thinking for what are you using graphene. For instance, of course, if you have graphene nanoparticles in suspension, these nanoparticles will enter the cell and maybe they will kill the cell. But if you use a graphene coating, that cells are not able to, 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 to absorb them. And even if they absorb, it's, it's not at the nanometric scale, maybe you will not have problems with cyto cytotoxicity. We have actually uh, done a very comprehensive study on the toxicity of graphene materials that we expect to see published in the next few months. Uh, we actually have just submitted a paper that we have evaluated the property of more than 40 types of graphene, not only the physical properties, but their chemical properties, and also their cytocompatibility. And in the end of this study, we just have concluded, we have concluded more things, but the, but the, 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 the aspect that was really, uh, that really, deserves to be highlighted is that what changes a lot the cytocompatible character of graphene is its quality. So what we have seen is that size, yeah, maybe a little bit. The concentration, yes, of course, concentration. Uh, carbon content, yes. Eh? But there's one thing that kept coming over and over and over. Every time you have impurities on graphene, you have very high cytotoxicity. So what is the message here? The message is if you want to use graphene for biomedical applications, maybe other industries, but let's talk about biomedical applications, you need to focus on quality. Quality first, as anything in our life. We get what you pay for. So why we are very positive with the cytocompatibility in our studies, and we have lots of papers showing that our cells are always happy on graphene. It's because the time we spend producing the graphene 
purifying, transferring, making sure you don't have byproducts from production, byproducts of graphene. Allow us to say that, yes, graphene is cytocompatible in every other study we show, because it goes back to the quality of the product. And in this paper that we expect to see very soon published, we're going to make this, uh, this uh, conclusion very bold in the paper. So, so yes, uh, we have identified common enemies, right? We have seen that even though we are very, we are being bombarded with this image of the COVID-19, fungi and bacteria, they also pose big, big threats to our health. We showed you how big is the problem of surfaces in our bodies, how many implants we put there every year, how many biofilms we developed, how many replacements we need to do because of these microorganisms colonizing our surfaces. We have shown you one way to solve this, and we are very excited about this way because graphene can be produced at very large scale at relatively low cost. It can be fully characterized by technologies that are already available. We can change the properties of graphene and make it available in surfaces of so many materials and 3D objects that can go inside our body. Graphene is very versatile, so even though we think about dental implants, we can also think about femur prosthesis, we can think about hip prosthesis, and it can be an affordable solution if you consider how many lives you can spare of undergoing new treatments of antibiotics and surgeries if you're just able to decrease biofilm availability at first. So we are excited because we are seeing that some of our ideas that have matured during these several years are going to the next step with, with a company even here in Singapore committed to uh, take our technologies to the next level and possibly to clinical application. So, Graphene, graphene nanocoating technology, as I have shown for you, has a great potential to prevent the colonization, stop the spread, decrease cross-contamination, and potentially cure lots of diseases. So what is, what is clear for us is that mankind cannot afford fighting a defensive war forever, waiting the next infection, to look for a solution. We need to take an offensive approach. You know what is, what is, what is, what is uh, very ironic is that four months ago, we were talking about going to Mars with SpaceX. And now we cannot go out just because there are some stuff outside that we just cannot see. So we are living this paradigm that we can do so many things but yet, because we are so responsive, we are so defensive, we wait so much instead of taking the control of the situation, we are living in a world inside our homes. So we think that is the time for us to think differently, not to rely only on the traditional techniques, but use technology to save millions of lives. So, Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open to receive questions. Uh, Vinicius, thank you very much. Um, folks, thank you for being here. So we have already a few questions from the audience. Uh, two questions, two related questions. Uh, one from Volodya Falco and Ana Arenas. Uh, what kind of uh, graphene did you use uh, on these studies? How, uh, uh, how do you control the thickness? What's the lifetime of these coatings? And the question whether the same effect would happen in the surface of graphite. Can you comment on that, please? Okay, so there's a, there are lots of questions there, right? So we, we, we use a technology that was nearly forgotten. We use the chemo 
chemical vapor deposition. And the reason why we use CVD is because we can produce uh, large areas of graphene at relative low cost. And because we have uh, the, the, the film, we can, we can get that film and to transfer into the surfaces that we have as a film. We don't use flakes. Uh, I, I particularly, I respect people that use flakes, but that's not what we use. I, I have a concerns about deflating. If, if that can last for a long time, was that the light? Uh, is something like that, right? No, how long does it last in the surface? Okay, it, it lasts for a long time, right? So, so let me give you, uh, let me give you some, some stuff that we have done. We have put graphene on, on titanium, on a real implant, and we have done a mock surgery in artificial bone and why I use artificial bone? Because artificial bone is way worse than natural bone. It's dry, it's very sharp, and very rough. And we, if we put our implants and we remove, we still see graphene. We have actually published a paper in Journal of Dental Research this year where we have done some friction tests and we have some data that we have uh, subjected our nano coating to extremely harsh solutions for eight months and remains uh, uh, the integrity remains very hard on uh, very high so uh, as far as we have measured the the structural integrity of the graphene nano coating is not a concern what about uh, would you get the same if you had uh, covered the surface with graphite oh yeah so that's that's interesting uh, yes and no uh, maybe yes, but there is a there's a paper from Barbaros in 2012 or 13 in uh, ACS Nano, where they show that human cells, for instance, they interact differently on graphite or amorphous carbon compared with graphene. We have a, uh, one study that we have tried to do, for instance, neurogenic differentiation on hexagonal boron nitride and we failed badly. And when we do that, the same neurogenic protocol on graphene, the neurogenesis just happens so easily. So, so yes, maybe you could have some effect. I just don't believe you would have the same effect because uh, the, the, the surrogate measures that we have, we, we don't try all the sorts of materials every time, of course, but the surrogate studies that we have done with other biological properties have shown that the material uh, ma matters a lot. And there are even papers showing that even the, the grain size of the graphene plays a big role on, their, on its biological properties. Okay. So, uh, uh, Siva Baum is asking you uh, essentially about, have you tried to do this with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2? And he says, I like your strategy, but you need a proof. Oh, yeah. So, so, uh, we, so we maybe might... you, you should tell what you're doing in regards to viruses because it was not clear. Yeah. So, so we invite you to keep tuned, right? Because we have ongoing work. But because of the, uh, of the circuit breaker in Singapore, and so many people being tested and everything, most of the resources for viral studies have been diverted to more urgent needs, right? So, yeah, I, I fully agree. We need to show the proof for that. Uh, that's why I was cautious to say we, we never said we, we're going to kill COVID-19. We, we know there are properties there that can be very promising. We actually are seeing some progress, but unfortunately for the last several weeks, uh, our study has, the, the, the rhythm has decreased a lot because of the circuit breaker. But yeah, that will come. So uh, Deepika Ranganathan is asking, is the graphene coating able to promote cell growth uh, like uh, osteoblasts for bone repair if the coating is coated on bone implants? Oh, yes, a lot. So that's, that's something I like a lot. We have done a lot on our lab. 
Uh, and, and we are glad to know that other people around the world have also tried that, getting similar results. So there's, graphene has a great osteogenic potential. We have a paper uh, early last year in the International Journal of Molecular Science where we show the mechanism of how graphene promotes osteogenic differentiation. So essentially the material that is so stiff but yet flexible uh, helps on the cell anchorage. And when the cell tries to move, it kind of makes some exercise like we do in the gym, becomes stressed. Then you have the activation of mechanosensitive pathways and that increases osteogenic differentiation. So that has been observed by our group and others, and we have spent some time also explaining uh, why that happens. But okay. it, yeah, it has a great potential for osteogenesis. So Rafael Lund is saying, congratulations, uh, Dr. Rosa. So because of your findings, do you believe that an antimicrobial effect is only related to difficult microbial adhesion to, to the material, or it can be related to antimicrobial contact? and or its uh, cytotoxicity. Okay. So Lund, Lund is my friend from Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Uh, there was a paper in scientific reports, I think it was in 2015, suggesting the facile transport, transport from electrons from graphene disrupting the metabolic pathways in the bacteria. Uh, that paper was dismissed. It was like in carbon in the next year, a group from France just proved by A plus B equals C that cannot happen. It's, it, it's just impossible for electrons to fly like that paper in scientific report was suggesting. So, so we have run the assays trying to kill bacteria. We, we have run assays seeing if human cells were happy. And, and it seems to me that cytocompatibility, either in terms of microorganisms or human cells, is, is not, is not a, a, a threat there. So we, we, re, we rarely see cells dying that we don't see in other materials, for instance. Whatever happens on our tissue culture plastic, we see that on, on, on the graphene. It's the same behavior. So I'm, I'm very positive with the data we have that, and, and also the paper from Carbon that uh, it's not about killing bacteria. It's, it's about anti-adhesive uh, anti properties, anti-adhesion properties. Okay. So we have uh, also similar questions from uh, Az, 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 Azade Mirabedini and uh, Ana Arenas. Is your technology scalable? for production of uh, pro uh, coating in prothesis? Uh, yeah, so, so scalability is always a concern for applications, right? But, but uh, uh, scalability is a, is a problem for, it's an engineering for problem. It's not a conceptual problem in, in, in graphing. You, you can produce big, big foils of graphene at relative low cost. You can transfer that using in pure engineering. So, and, and actually the cost, once the, the lab is set, it's not that high, right? Uh, we, we think we can coat, let's say, a dental implant for less than $3 a piece. If you think that the implant costs by itself about $100, $150, it doesn't add to the cost. So uh, another question here from, uh... Gokieda, what do you mean by high quality? Do you consider graphene oxide low quality graphene? Uh, hi, Goki. Uh, no. So, so uh, we, uh, the data that we have, we actually have splitted uh, graphene in few def fewer defects and high defect graphene, right? We have not tested graphene oxide in that paper. So we, 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 we got this, I think it was 36 types of graphene, and we have characterized with TGA, uh, Raman, and XPS. And, and we, were, we were able to identify 
that actually we didn't have graphene oxide there. So I, I cannot I cannot answer your question like directly like graphene oxide is low is low is of low quality because we haven't studied at that at that at that time the graphene oxide. What we have there were all our samples were graphene only because uh, in my group I, I I don't work with the graphene oxide. We just work with uh, pristine graphene, mainly the the graphene by CPD. Uh, so Christian Schaffer is asking if. Uh, uh, the, 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 if the reason why there, there are antimicrobial properties in your CVD graphene is because there is copper contamination. Okay, so, so if, you, if you go to the paper we published in uh, Nanotoxicology 2018, we show data from XPS, also in JDR 2020, Journal of Dental Research, we show the data from XPS, uh, confirming that all the copper was removed before being transferred uh, to, of course, considering the, 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 the detection limit of the equipment that is actually pretty high, right? So, so as long, every time that we, most of the times, we, we, we take some samples to the XPS to make sure that we are using uh, the, the materials that have been uh, de de devoid of, of copper, and and the data doesn't show the peaks for for copper. Okay, so uh, uh, Jose or Jose Munuera is asking you. Uh, you mentioned that graphene impurities make the toxicity. Does this include defects, edges, and so on, or just uh, extra atoms? Okay, so so it's not only the defect, right? So so when we when we talk about toxicity. We need to take in consideration things like size. We need to take in consideration concentration. And in that case, what, what was coming more pronounced for us was that every time we have impurities, these things, defects, the, 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 the problem of toxicity was being escalated. So in that work, what we have seen is, for instance, byproducts from graphene production. So instead of, because if you, if you use graphene, you should have carbon, right? So when you start having sulfur, when you start having uh, other chemical elements that should not be there, and you know by the production roots that they are used to exfoliate graphite or whatever, you know th that's an impurity. So, so mainly two, uh, two entities were, were more relevant. The presence of impurities from production and also the presence of defects in the structure. What, the pre what one or the other is doing is a bit hard to say. We have measured, for instance, membrane damage. So we have realized that when you have more defects on the structure, the membranes, they break more easily. But we have realized when we have more impurities, the membrane becomes, uh, remains uh, healthy, but the cells still die. So you know it's not a problem of rupture, it's a problem of inner toxicity. So, so, so those were more or less the, 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 the two main aspects that we have observed coming more often for toxicity. The presence of defects in the structure and the presence of residues from production. Okay, so one last question from Mohamed Alessi. What happens if you coat with other 2D materials? What properties of graphene are relevant for your nano coating applications? Okay, uh, if you coat with other materials, you can have perhaps the same effect, you can have different effects, right? Uh, again, uh, we cannot study everything. If you think about 2D materials, there are like 2,000 2D materials on Earth. We have done one study with, but that's not with bacteria, with uh, cells using hexagonal boronitrite, monolayer, and graphene. And the biological effects were just too opposite to be true. It was like black and white. So I believe that if you use different materials, you will have different effects, provided you know the properties of these materials. Why I like and why in 2013, I, I, I went to Antonio's office and I let's try graphene was because it's transparent. 
So my first application, of course, I'm a dentist. So I don't like materials that are black, right? So if I think about a dental, a dental implant where you put a layer of graphite there, it doesn't matter the type of effect you have, you're not going to the market because it's just black. So I like because it was transparent. I like because it has very surface, a large surface area. So I could use on my implant without increasing weight, for instance. I like it's stretchable, so I can coat different shapes. And I like it's elastic, so I can use polymers to hold it when I'm trying to put here and there. So these were the main four properties that uh, I, 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 I always say, I, I never, I never start studying graphing just because I heard the word, oh, everybody's studying that, I should be doing that as well. I really focus on the properties that I think could be relevant for biomedical implants. Vinicius, I want to thank you very much uh, for the seminar. I want to announce that next week we're going to have Professor Manish Shoala from the Cambridge University in the UK. So follow us on uh, the, our website uh, for more information. He's going to talk, as you can see, Van der Waals contacts on 2D semiconductors. Folks, thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed and see you again next week. Take care. Okay. Thank you, thank you Vinicius. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye.